the sun is shining, the birds singing, and clouds chase each other over hill and dale. Perhaps the sun shines too brightly. The birds sing too sweetly, as though aware that they may soon be extinguished forever in this world of ours. A world where one of nature's more humble creations has become the symbol for the most devastating of man-made catastrophes. As some of us know, nuclear weapons burst on or near the ground produce, in addition to fire and blast damage, the grave problem of radioactive fallout. The gravity of this additional hazard cannot be overstressed. The fact that you cannot hear, feel, see or smell radiation makes it all the more insidious. For the average person, in a town or in the quiet of the countryside, this is a problem that cannot easily be understood. The purpose of this film is to show you not only how to save your own life should a nuclear attack come, but also how to play a vitally important part in reducing the terrible death roll and casualties from radiation sickness, which might otherwise result through lack of understanding of this problem. The radioactive hazard comes, of course, under two headings, immediate and residual. Severe danger from immediate radiation, from a 10 megaton explosion, for instance, is limited in the open to within two and a half miles, and there will be no significant effect beyond about four miles from ground zero. However, as blast brings this first distance within the range of total destruction, the risk of immediate radiation is of secondary importance. With a weapon burst on or near the ground, residual radiation, as its name implies, is a much more lasting hazard, with a threat to those further afield. The explosion throws up thousands and thousands of tons of material, earth, steel and rubble, from the crater. Much of this is pulverized to dust and is sucked up to great heights by the powerful upcurrents of air which develop as a result of the searing heat of the explosion. This material becomes contaminated and highly radioactive through contact with the fireball. The heavier material sucked upwards will fall out quickly, but the lighter material will be carried away and deposited over a large area downwind of ground zero although the drifting cloud may not be seen and the fallout from it may well be unnoticed. This radioactively contaminated material continues to emit two kinds of radiation, known as beta and gamma rays. Of these two forms of radiation from fallout, gamma rays are the most dangerous. Beta rays have a range in air of only a few yards and are stopped by ordinary clothing. Gamma rays, on the other hand, have a very great penetrating power, similar to X-rays, and only gradually lose their intensity in passing through dense materials. With a human body, the degree of penetration by radiation varies considerably. Beta rays are harmless unless the source of the rays gets within the body itself or is in actual contact with the skin. Gamma rays, however, are much more penetrating and can cause very serious damage to the deeper living tissues. Damage which in severe cases will be fatal. Furthermore, their deadly work is not instantaneous because these rays build up an accumulating dose so long as one is exposed to them. Casualties may not therefore occur immediately. In fact, not until several days or even weeks later. Before considering the means of protection from radiation, it's necessary to see how radiation is measured. Just as the pint is used to measure fluid and an inch to measure length, so the unit used to measure radiation is called a runcheon. A dosimeter is the instrument used for measuring an individual's radiation dose as it is received and a radiac survey meter is used for measuring dose rate. These two together can be likened to the speedometer of a car, which measures the total mileage covered 
and also the speed in miles per hour. Any exposure to radioactivity is to be avoided if possible. But there are certain limits which, in emergency, can be accepted without producing immediate radiation sickness. So, to allow urgent life-saving operations to be carried out, it's proposed to set the wartime emergency dose at a total of 75 runtion. This dose may be received in a few hours or spread out over several days and is in fact half 150 runtion, the dose at which radiation sickness may start. 300 runtion may result in perhaps 30% deaths. 350 to 500 runtion, 50% deaths. And doses of over 600 runtion could be fatal to all. Protection against gamma radiation from fallout is obtained through three factors. First, the distance one is from the source of radiation. Second, the screening of radiation by solid substances. And third, the decay of radiation with time. If these factors are considered in more detail, it can be seen that much can be done to minimize the total dose received. First, as much as one third of the dose a person in the open would receive from fallout comes from a relatively short distance around him, from within something like 12 feet. About half the dose comes from within 25 feet, and as much as three quarters from a radius of 100 feet all round. So anyone in a house of reasonable size automatically escapes part of the dose due to the distance factor. Secondly, the thickness of the walls, floors and roof between the nearest fallout and those in refuge has a screening value, which gives further protection. Thirdly, decay weakens this radioactivity as time is spent in refuge. This decay of radiation with time is rather like a red-hot poker cooling down, quickly at first and then more gradually. If, for example, one hour after the explosion, the dose rate is 100 runtion per hour. After seven times one hour, seven hours, it'll be reduced to 10 runtion per hour. After seven times seven hours, 49 hours or two days, to one runtion per hour. After seven times two days, 14 days, the dose rate will be reduced to one tenth runtion per hour. And after three months, it should be around one hundredth of a runtion per hour. Thus, it will be seen that most of the decay takes place in the first two days. Taking the factors of distance and screening alone, it's likely that ordinary two-storey houses in a closely built-up area, which helps screening, would cut the dose to about a fortieth for anyone on the ground floor. So, if the dose accumulated in the open was 200 runtion, then in the center of the ground floor of such a house, the dose could be reduced to about five runtion. In a cellar, it could be less than one runtion. In a slit trench with one foot of overhead cover, it drops to about two runtion. And in a slit trench with three foot of overhead cover, the dose is reduced to less than one runtion. Bungalows, or single-storey prefabricated houses, offer little protection against fallout. But even an isolated two-storey house in the country gives a fair measure of protection, which can be improved quite easily. However, the bigger and more solid the building, and the more it's surrounded by other buildings, the better is the chance of escaping trouble, especially if it has relatively few windows. Any room on the ground floor of a house with not more than one outside wall can be converted into a refuge room. The first consideration must be to block up the windows. This can be done by boarding over both sides of the windows and filling up the space with earth. The protective factor of the room can be increased by adding an outer or inner lining of sandbags or boxes filled with earth. Even bookcases or heavy furniture will help to some degree. 
excellent protection could alternatively be found by digging a slit trench within the foundations of a house. Before doing this, however, it would be best to obtain the expert advice of a builder or architect. Equally good, but less comfortable, is a slit trench in the garden, with the added protection of overhead cover. A site should be chosen that is not likely to be covered by debris from nearby buildings. In some places, of course, a slit trench would be impracticable because of subsoil water. It may be necessary to spend several days in such a refuge, so it should be made as comfortable as possible. The thickness of overhead cover depends upon the nature of the substance employed. Three feet of well-packed earth, which is equivalent to two feet of concrete, will give good protection against fallout and all other effects of a nuclear explosion to anyone who is not within three or four miles of the burst. Everyone caught in the fallout area must realize the necessity of spending several days in an adequate refuge room. As a general rule, this period will not be less than two days before they can be allowed out for short periods. As far as fallout is concerned, it will, however, be reasonable to leave refuge rooms for a few minutes at a time, perhaps to go to the lavatory or to fetch cooking water stored in the bath. Everything should be laid on in advance, so that after taking cover, the household can exist on its own resources without the need to go out for further supplies until it becomes safe to do so. Each house should have at least a week's supply of food and water kept in dustproof containers, and preferably a battery-operated wireless set so that contact with the outer world can be maintained. A torch and spare batteries, or candles, should be at hand in case of power failure, and adequate provision made for emergency sanitation if no indoor facilities are available. We now know something of what radiation is and how we can obtain protection from it. Our problem is to apply what we have learnt to the overall situation that is likely to develop after the explosion of a nuclear weapon. From a large megaton weapon burst on or near the ground, an area of a few miles upwind and crosswind of ground zero is likely to have residual radiation of a seriously high level. This comes from the very active heavier particles that are deposited fairly soon after the explosion. The distance on the upwind side from ground zero will depend on the strength of the wind, and similarly the contour around the whole area would be broken up as the weather influences the pattern of contamination. Conditions will vary with circumstances, and obviously no rule of thumb can be applied. Apart from upwind and crosswind contamination, a much larger area downwind of ground zero will be affected by fallout from the radioactive cloud. From a really large nuclear weapon, this fallout pattern may extend up to 500 miles downwind of ground zero and be 100 miles in width. Or, depending upon the strength of the wind, up to 1,000 miles downwind and 50 miles in width. With a westerly wind, it should be appreciated that this maximum range extends across half Europe, and it may well stretch as far as Poland, a sobering thought to attacker and attacked alike. In this country, two special warnings, which will originate from sector operations centers, are planned to advise those areas that are likely to come within the fallout pattern. These warnings will depend upon information supplied by the National Warning and Monitoring Organization based on the Royal Observer Corps posts. These posts will send fallout readings through to their group headquarters, who in turn will relay this information to sector operations centers so that a plot of radioactivity can be built up. The meteorological services will provide further information for forecasting the direction that the fallout cloud will take, so that the first warning, warning grey, can be given. This warning will be given to areas which are thought to be in the path of the fallout, but indicates that it should not arrive for at least another hour. The grey warning will be given by some prearranged signal, 
It may be by siren, perhaps by the ringing of church bells or some other distinctive signal. For the purpose of this film, this special note on the siren will indicate warning grey. This would give people enough time to check their refuge arrangements and to do last minute actions such as gathering and storing a few more fresh vegetables or seeing that baths are topped up with a plentiful supply of clean water in addition to that stored in the refuge for drinking. It may also give farmers a chance to bring in their valuable animals and livestock to nearby shelter. Another distinctive warning, warning black, will be given possibly by maroons when the arrival of fallout is imminent or actually recorded. Everyone will immediately take refuge and remain there until they are told that they may come out or in fact are ordered to do so later for their own safety. It should be appreciated that in some cases it may not be possible for the National Warning Organization to give grey or indeed black warnings. If this is the case, those in control on the spot must use their initiative and originate a black warning on radiac instrument readings alone with whatever means are at their disposal. That is the overall situation. It is unlikely that more than one nuclear weapon will be dropped in the same district, but the deployment and entry of mobile forces may well be frustrated by fallout from distant weapons. In this case, reinforcements are advancing from the upwind and crosswind directions. Suddenly, Joint Military Regional Headquarters controlling the operation are warned of likely fallout from another weapon a hundred miles away. This looks like cutting off two of the advancing columns. They are contacted by radio and diverted. Deployment plans will have to be completely reorganized, new routes chosen, and new reception areas warned. The possibility of other weapons complicating the picture must always be borne in mind. For any ground or near ground explosion, there will be two distinct areas for operations. First, there will be the damaged area round ground zero, overlaid by fallout. And secondly, the much larger area downwind, which is affected by fallout only. We will now consider the effect of fallout in the damaged area. It's generally assumed that large nuclear weapons are more likely to be exploded at or near ground level than high in the air, because the attacker gains an added bonus of fallout without much impairing the heat or blast effects. You'll remember that within 20 miles of ground zero, after the explosion of a large megaton weapon, there will be rings of varying degrees of destruction. It's proposed to call these A, B, C, and D. For example, after a 10 megaton burst, A represents total destruction out to three and a half miles, B, irreparable damage out to five miles, C, severe to moderate damage out to 13 miles, and D, light damage out to 20 miles. It must be appreciated that areas of A and B damage will have suffered enormous destruction, possibly rendering them impenetrable to life-saving teams and at the same time making it difficult for the warning system to operate. There will inevitably be large numbers of dead and dying in these areas, and those that escape with their lives will be subject to the additional hazard of fallout. Here in A and B, the fallout will probably carry a lethal dose to those exposed to it in the open. Initially, it may be so great that the chances of survival of people here, if they survive the blast and other direct hazards, will depend upon the degree of protection from fallout that remains for them. It may be in a slit trench or in the basement of a damaged building, like this. 
For at least two days, those who survive, warden and public alike, must expect to be self-supporting. They will have to rely on their emergency stores of food and water and remain under cover until they can be released. It will be difficult to know what is happening outside. But in the damaged area, those who have battery-operated wireless sets could be reached by general situation reports and other announcements broadcast on a previously arranged channel. The area around your house may be dangerously radioactive from fallout. In areas of C and D damage, the task facing the life-saving teams will be immense. C will contain some trapped casualties and large numbers of seriously injured, whilst in D, there will be considerable numbers of slightly injured people. Part of C is also likely to be within the fire belt caused by the heat effect. As a short time may elapse before fallout arrives in areas C and D, especially upwind of ground zero, it is not proposed to sound a black warning until a reading of three runcheon per hour is recorded, thus enabling home cover forces to tackle such vital tasks as local firefighting and the rescuing of trapped and injured people. Damage by fire and blast may render some buildings unfit for protection from fallout. In such cases, householders will have to take their families to alternative shelter, perhaps to another building which is less severely damaged, or to their own slit trench in the garden. The warden, during this period, must realise that fallout is no respecter of uniforms. He should take cover as soon as the dose rate approaches three runcheon per hour. Although the National Warning Organization will make every attempt to give a black warning, this may not always be possible. No matter what happens, the responsibility will always be with the man on the spot with the meter. He will give a local warning by whatever means are available. It may be sounded by whistle, by maroons, or by some other means. We must now consider how the incoming life-saving teams can carry out their tasks without receiving too high a dose. The Civil Defence Controller will direct efforts to the upwind and crosswind sides of the stricken city, so that they can start their vital work at a comparatively low dose rate. You will remember that 75 runcheon is proposed as the wartime emergency dose the dose which we could receive with little risk of radiation sickness. Wardens and controllers already in the fallout area, who are briefing or aiding incoming forces, must watch that they do not exceed the emergency dose. The problem for the civil defence controller is how best to conserve each team's emergency dose. For you'll remember that the 75 runcheon could either be received in a few hours or spread out over several days. For the majority of life-saving forces, it will probably pay to work non-stop for a period of eight hours at a dose rate of 10 runcheon per hour, incurring their total dose of 75 runcheon before being withdrawn altogether. Reconnaissance teams will have penetrated into areas in advance of life-saving units and will have radioed back dose rates to headquarters, where they will be plotted and transferred onto the control room map supplementing information from the Royal Observer Corps. These 10 runcheon lines, distinguished by the time after burst to which they apply, provide a simple guide to the limit up to which operations can be commenced without delay or undue risk. The pattern of fallout in the 20 mile radius of damage round ground zero is likely to be very variable. The contours of radioactivity will be irregular and upwind of ground zero, the 10 runcheon line could initially be anything from a mile or two to 10 miles under low wind conditions. We will now take a case at H plus two, two hours after the burst, where the 10 runcheon line has been established at seven miles upwind from ground zero and at nine miles on the flank. As radiation decays with time, the 10 runcheon line will contract. As plotted on the control room map, the 10 runcheon line at H plus 12 
will be a mile or two closer in. At h plus 24, closer still. While by h plus 48, on the upwind side, it may have contracted to a point beyond which it will be impracticable to penetrate anyway. When teams have used up their wartime emergency dose of 75 runcheon, arrangements will, where possible, be made for their relief and withdrawal to work in uncontaminated areas. If, however, it has been impossible to relieve a team before it has received 75 runcheon, the unit commander may, if the situation warrants it, continue working up to a total dose of 100 runcheon, as an absolute maximum. Similarly, it would obviously be intolerable to restrict all rescue operations to the 10 runcheon line in every circumstance. For instance, in areas threatened by fires, the controller may decide that it will be necessary for the personnel involved to incur their 75 runcheon in one shift of four hours, working at about 20 runcheons per hour. The total dose must still, however, be checked on dosimeters. We now know something of the conditions that are likely to exist in the damaged areas. The life-saving teams entering from the upwind and crosswind sides should, by working to the contracting 10 runcheon line, be able to penetrate progressively to within a few miles of ground zero. And so, the important tasks of life-saving, rescue work, firefighting, and care of the injured and homeless will go on. But no matter how much trained rescue aid is available, Emphasis must still be laid on self-help. Progressively, a picture will be built up of the pattern of fallout and its severity in the damaged area. The problem will be sized up, plans made and put into operation. Some will not make this journey out of the damaged area. The number who do may well depend on the example you set showing them the way to prepare and protect themselves from radioactive fallout.